I am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the Scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. The Bible is an integrated document. It is not a loose collection of documents with no coherence. In order to understand the individual books, we must understand the whole. Genesis is not the first book of the Bible for no reason. Neither is Revelation the last book of the Bible for no reason. The book of Genesis and the book of Revelation have been described as the bookends that hold the Bible together. In Genesis you have the story of the beginning of human sin, and in Revelation you have the end of it. The prologue of Revelation in chapter 1 verse 1 to 3 says the following, The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear, and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. As I pointed out in the last podcast, episode 19, the first important word in this portion is the word revelation. The Greek word is apocalypsis, which means unveiling, and not a great and total devastation or a violent and cataclysmic end, as we tend to interpret the word today. Unveiling something means to take away that which was previously obscured. Apocalypses have to do with mysteries, and in this book we will find many mysteries made clear, or unveiled. The second important word in this passage is blessing. The Greek word for blessing is based on the Hebrew word esher. This is unusual because the normal word for blessing, as we understand, is translated as barak in Hebrew. Barak means to bow down. Esher, however, means to guide. So this special word for blessing would fit in John's intention for the book. It can be a guide to its readers. The third and final key phrase that I want to re-emphasize is in the second part of the first verse. The phrase is, made it known. These words have a hidden meaning in the Greek. The Greek word, semeno, means to mark, or to indicate, or to signify. The literal meaning of this phrase, therefore, is to make known by means of signs or symbols. In other words, Jesus symbolized it to his servant John. This is a very important aspect of the book of Revelation. It is a book largely of symbols, not historical records, or moral laws and guidelines, or even parables. An important fact to remember when trying to understand Revelation is that it is not a factual book or historical record like Exodus or Acts. So therefore we cannot choose to apply our own understanding to it. There is no indication that the beast of Revelation is an actual animal, and we can therefore accept it as a symbol of something else. But at the same time, the rest of the beasts in the book should also be regarded as symbolic, as there is no indication from the author, which was God inspiring John, that some are real creatures and some are symbolic. With that short recap out of the way, let us proceed a little further into Revelation. Jesus said to the writer of the book, John, in Revelation 1 verses 19, Write the things which you have seen in the vision, and the things which are now happening, and the things which will take place after these things. I am reading this from the Amplified Bible as it clearly communicates what Jesus is saying to all of us. First, John was told to write what you have seen. That covers the vision of chapter 1. What John the Apostle saw was the Lord Jesus himself walking in the midst of his churches. Then, John was told to write what is now. That occupies chapters 2 and 3, that is, the letters to the seven churches, which is a broad prophecy of the present age of the church. Then, John was told to write what will take place after this. This occupies the largest part of the book of Revelation, from chapter 4 to the end of the book, which is a prophecy of what will take place after the church age. In Revelation chapters 2 and 3 we find seven letters which have been largely ignored and unopened by the Christian church over the years. 
most Christians today who are quite familiar with the Sermon on the Mount are not aware of the existence of the seven messages of Christ to His church. Many people tend to skip over these seven letters to the churches because they are eager to hurry on to those exciting, action-packed sections of Revelation. It seems we would rather hear about the great cataclysms of the last days than be confronted with the urgent challenges of today. These seven letters to seven churches are potent letters, written with urgency. Their message is still as relevant and timely today as when they were first written. So many problems in our churches in the 2020s could be cured if only we would listen with attentive ears to the message Jesus gave us through the pen of John 2,000 years ago. Many theologians view the seven churches as representative of seven church ages before the rapture. Using this formula, the letter to Ephesus would be the first century apostolic church, moving on through the Middle Ages, finally ending with Laodicea being the last letter representing the end times church. While this view is definitely intriguing, and there are definitely some similarities which we will touch on, we should never forget that these letters were written to seven real churches in Asia Minor, and therefore have historical significance, relevant to the historical time. Secondly, the messages to the seven churches can also be viewed as timeless. The problems that the church in Ephesus faced, we face. The problems that the church of Smyrna faced, we face. And so on. In almost every church today, you will find Ephesian Christians, Sardis Christians, and Laodicean Christians. The problems, temptations, promises, and blessings are all still issues that we wrestle with today. The Spirit is still making the plea today for those who have an ear to hear what He is saying to the churches. In these letters, our Lord outlines for us His plan for the church. He shows us that He has sent His church in the midst of the world. It is His instrument to influence and direct the course of human history. In Matthew 5 verses 14, Jesus calls His church the light of the world. And in Matthew 5 verses 13, the salt of the earth. In 1 Timothy 3 verses 15, the Apostle Paul calls the church the pillar and ground of truth. That is the mystery and the mission of the church. God intends the church to exert tremendous influence over the affairs of the world. These seven letters lay out God's plan, so it is a bad mistake to play down the importance and relevance of these letters. They are filled with both warnings and encouragements to churches that are struggling with sin and complacency within and persecution without. In these letters, our Lord teaches the church how to live as light in a darkening world while also confronting the sin and error that threatens the health and life of the church. As we begin to study these seven letters, I am sure that two questions would be popping into your thoughts. Why are only seven churches addressed? And, why these particular seven? The answer is that these are seven representative churches. They were carefully selected by Jesus to represent not only the whole spectrum of churches that existed in the first century AD, but the spectrum of churches that exist now in the 21st century. There were many churches in the province of Asia Minor at the time John wrote this letter. Other churches could also have been chosen. In fact, many other churches in Asia Minor were better known, such as the churches at Colossae or Troas. But the Lord chose these seven churches because they represent conditions that have prevailed throughout church history from the beginning to the end. There are seven basic types of churches that exist in any period of church history. Every church that truly knows Jesus as Lord can be recognized as fitting one of these seven models at some particular moment in its history. By either repentance or disobedience, a church may change from one classification to another of these seven basic types, but it can always be found somewhere within the sevenfold pattern. These letters can also serve as a preview of the entire history of the church from its beginning to the last days. They could represent seven stages or key periods in church history. As we have read in Revelation 1 verses 3, the entire book of Revelation is called a prophecy. This prophecy includes chapters 2 and 3 as well as the rest of the book. 
I mentioned in the previous podcast that the number seven is important and features prominently throughout the book of Revelation. It is the number of completeness and perfection. It is God's number. These seven letters then constitute our Lord's complete overview of the church, stage by stage, from beginning to end. We must never forget that the whole of the book of Revelation was written for these seven churches. Each church, not just one particular church from chapters 2 and 3, is expected to know and understand the entire book of Revelation. As we explore these seven letters, I will briefly trace the different historical periods of the Christian church, while also carefully examining what the Lord says to each of these seven historical churches. Revelation 1 verses 19 to 20 says, Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are, and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Before we begin with the first church of Ephesus, note firstly that all these churches have been called lampstands. In other words, they are bearers of light. They are not the light themselves, but they hold or bear the light. The light is the truth as it is in Jesus, that truth which God wants the human race to know. No seminary or university has knowledge of the truth which the church is given to tell the world. It is the business of the church to tell the truth to the world. Believers are not expected to make our way through this difficult world as best we can, coming together in little holy huddles to survive until the coming of the Lord. We have an influence to exercise, and these letters to the seven churches emphasizes that fact. Secondly, each letter is addressed to the angel of the church. What is meant by the angel of the church? This word can be translated messenger, and in other parts of the New Testament it does have that meaning. But it does not have that meaning elsewhere in Revelation. The word angel appears many times in the book outside these seven letters, and in every case it refers to a heavenly being, what we normally think of as an angel. So I am suggesting here that each church has a heavenly being responsible for guiding the human leadership of that church. In some theological circles, this angel or messenger is thought to be a reference to the pastor of the church. But that is not likely, since all the churches of the New Testament never had a single human leader. This is a mistake that most churches make today. Leadership is always found in the plural, elders and pastors of churches. No individual human leader is addressed here, so I have to concede that it is sent to the angel of the church, the heavenly being that is responsible to help the human leaders of the church to know the mind of God. Remember what it says in Hebrews 1 verses 14. Are angels not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? In other words, Christian believers. It seems very likely, therefore, that in the invisible realm, which is very real but which we cannot see, there are angels assigned to each church to help the leaders and congregations to know what is in the heart of the Lord. And somewhere within these seven letters we will find our own respective local churches. If you think of all the letters in the New Testament, the letters of Paul, Peter, James and John, and these letters from Jesus Christ to the seven churches in Asia Minor, do you ever wonder if the human writers of these letters stop to think of the history, those 2,000 years of church history that would follow, and the millions and millions of believers who would someday read these words? We probably have not. We are pretty insular and blinkered in our thinking, but I am convinced that God, when he inspired all these letters, was thinking not only of the time in which they were written, but of the centuries of history that were to come. This is why these letters, written two millennia ago, will continue to be relevant and give life to the church in our own era, as well as in every previous age. We are continuing to make history, to continue the legacy of the church history that extends all the way back to Jesus and his disciples. The letters of the Bible, including these seven letters to these seven churches, were written with history in mind. Future history. This is our history. A history filled with computers and the internet and space travel, but with the unchanging human condition, 
the age-old problem of human sin. So, if we have ears to hear, let us listen to what the Lord has to say to the churches, and to you, and to me. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveller in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 20. Thank you.